I'm Dr. Michio Kaku, professor of theoretical physics, and I'd like to talk about the theory of everything, but from a different point of view. Today, I want to talk about the historic, as well as the personal implications of a theory of everything. But first of all, let me be honest, I'm coming from a certain point of view, of course. I've been working on string theory since 1968. However, I'll try to give you a balanced historic view of this whole question. First of all, I first heard about a theory of everything when I was eight years old. Something happened which changed my life completely. It was in all the newspapers. All the newspapers announced that a great scientist had just died, but they put a picture, this picture, on the evening news. And the commentators said that the greatest scientists of our time could not finish this book. On his desk was a book that could not be finished by the greatest scientist of our time. Well, I was fascinated by the story. Who was this man? Why couldn't he finish this book? I mean, it's a homework problem, right? Why couldn't he ask his mother? Why couldn't he go to the library? Well, that's what I did. I decided that I wanted to go to the library to find out what is this theory that this man could not finish? That is, what is the theory of everything? Well, in the library, they told me that his name was Albert Einstein. And it was to be the theory of everything. That is an equation, perhaps, no more than one inch long, that would allow us to, quote, read the mind of God. Well, I was fascinated by this story. And I said to myself, I, I want to be part of this dream. I want to be part of this effort to complete this dream of a theory that would unify all the forces of the universe. So in my latest book, which is a New York Times bestseller, The God Equation, I talk about this historic quest, this historic quest going all the way back in the annals of time. You see, all of us have wondered, what does it all mean? When we look at the night sky and we see the billions of stars in the universe, we say to ourselves, what, what message could the universe be telling me? What does it all mean? Why? Where is the farthest star? Where is the end of space and time? These are the questions that you ask yourself on a simple night, simply looking at the night sky. Well, it was Aristotle who tried to put some of these thoughts down on paper and ink. And he said that the universe is composed of four things. There was a unified theory of everything there was, air, water, fire, earth. From these four substances, you could derive everything else. Well, also we had Democritus. Democritus believed in something called atoms. A means cannot, tum means cut. Atom literally means that which cannot be cut. But then Pythagoras, the famous mathematician of the Pythagorean theorem, came out and said, no, 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 no. It's not air, water, and fire. It's not atoms. It's music. You see, one day he looked at a lyre string and he plucked it. And he realized that the notes on a lyre string come in discrete quantities. And then he went to a blacksmith. And the blacksmith, if you hit a bar of iron, the longer the iron, the lower the note. So he said, aha, that explains the diversity, the splendorous diversity of matter in the universe. Music is nothing but different vibrations on a lyre string. That's what the universe is all about. Well, of course, the Roman Empire fell apart around 400 AD so or so, and all these philosophical discussions came to a rest. However, that didn't stop people from speculating about these things. The Ptolemaic system thought that the universe could be explained in epicycles, cycles within cycles within cycles. 
That's what drives the universe. Copernicus thought, no, 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 no. The Earth is not the center of the solar system, it is the sun. But all these academic debates going all the way back to Galileo were finally resolved with the work of Isaac Newton. He was walking on his country estate one day and saw an apple fall. And then he asked the question for the ages. If an apple falls to the earth, does the moon also fall? Well, the answer is yes. The moon falls like an apple, but it spins around the earth. So in other words, Newton came up not with just a theory of gravity, he came with the unified theory, a theory that unified the laws of the heaven with the laws of the earth. Even though the church said that the heavens obeyed celestial laws and were perfect, while earthlings lived with mortal sin and corruption, Newton said no, there's a unified theory, a universal theory of gravity. Well, that held for the next 200 years with the next advance coming with James Clerk Maxwell. He wrote down the laws of electricity, E here, and magnetism, or B, shown here. And then he noticed something. He noticed that if E vibrates, it turns into magnetism, B. But if magnetism vibrates, it turns back into E. And then he asks himself the question for the ages. If E turns into B, turns back into E, then what is the speed of that transition, that wave that is created? He calculated it and he had the shock of his life. He found that the speed of vibrating electromagnetic fields is a speed of light. In other words, this is a theory of light but it's a unified theory. E and B are symmetrical in these equations. If you turn E into B and B into E, it's hardly possible to tell them apart. So in other words, he created a unified theory, just the same way that Newton created a theory that unified the heavens and the earth. Well, but we still have the problem raised all the way back by Democritus. Why are there so many different kinds of substances. Well, Mendeleev, of course, took a giant step forward by putting all the basic elements into a chart. But then the question is, where did the chart come from? Finally, we had a picture of the inside of the atom. Ernest Rutherford, shown here, took a piece of radium, which glowed with a new kind of force worked out by Madame Curie the nuclear force. Well, the nuclear force seemed to be beyond the work of Newton, beyond the work of Maxwell. So he put radium in a lead box shown here on the left. And the beam that came out, he shot through a piece of gold. And then these particles, these alpha particles scattered in all directions. In other words, there was a hard ball, a hard ball at the center of the atom. In other words, we now had a picture of the atom itself. Electrons, electrons moving around a very dense core made out of protons and neutrons. So by the 1930s, scientists began to say, aha, we have now a theory of everything. Gravity can be explained by Newton. Light can be explained by Maxwell's equations. And the atom can be explained by protons, neutrons, and electrons. It was so simple. So people began to say, this is it. Physics is coming to a close. We now have a theory of everything we see around us. Well, not so fast. You see, after World War II, people began to say, well, are there particles beyond the neutrons and the protons that we missed? So what they did was they started to build atom smashers, like the cyclotron shown here. Gigantic machines which would whirl particles around in a circle and then smash them, giving us insight into what is inside a proton. What is inside a neutron? Are there more particles that we missed? Well, yes. <laughs> when scientists begin to piece apart the proton, 
they found much to their dismay that there were scores of particles, higher excitations of the proton. This was a mess. It was thought to be simple. Neutrons, protons, and electrons, that's it. That makes up the universe. Nope. Inside the proton, there are quarks. Three quarks that make up the proton. A quark and an antiquark make up what is called the meson. And soon we had a zoo, a zoo of subatomic particles. So did the zoo ever end? Well, of course. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.